Good morning, everybody. The reading, the reading this morning is 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 to 12. And in the church Bible, it's page 1217. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Christ Jesus is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him now. You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when you spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, we just pray that you'll anoint Charles afresh, that your spirit will just come through him, flow through him, and just bring those words, just let those words come, Lord, that you want us to hear. And just pray that our ears are open, our eyes and are seeing, and that we can actually hear your word and take it on board. So bless him now, Lord, and empower him as he brings that word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matthew. One, two. Thank you. Well, good morning, church.
He's written about in all the Gospels more than any other disciple. Peter tested the limits. He was the one that tried to walk on water, if you remember. He was the one that says all the wrong things. That reminds us of us. He was the one that was rebuked. Even Jesus Christ at some point told him, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter was an amazing guy and still is an amazing guy. So when Peter, who walked with the Lord, when he decides to give counsel or advice, he knows what he's talking about. He speaks with the authority as with one who walked directly with the agent of creation, the creator of the world. He saw so many things. So when he gives advice, he's speaking truth. He was one of those privileged enough to see the Lord Jesus Christ ascend to heaven, turned water into wine, all manner of miracles. Peter saw those things happen before his very eyes. So he was not speaking theoretically. He was speaking from a position of power and authority. So I think we best listen to also what he has to say. I'm making some reference to the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible essentially gives meaning to the original Greek and Hebrew. It brings it alive, helping us to understand the thoughts and ideas behind the words that we read in the Bible. So if you don't have a copy, I think it's a great thing to have had this for almost 18 years, to have this and to help us understand as we also study. So what I've done essentially is to list out a few things I want to run through very, very quickly. I have titled my small talk today, Purified by Fire, a subject I understand very well. God's plan of salvation meets every believer's need. Peter begins by giving praise and gives 11 reasons initially for this praise. That one, God is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, so we need to give praise for that. Two, God has given us this new birth, which I'll be talking about in a moment. Three, his mercy is the reason for this new birth, a very important point, God's mercy. Four, the result of the mercy is a living hope. Five, the means of this hope is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Six, our inheritance is the object of this hope. Seven, this hope which cannot be destroyed by anything. Eight, the inheritance is kept in heaven. Nine, God shields us for the inheritance by his power. Ten, our faith is the means of the shielding, which is a very important point, which I'll discuss in a moment. Eleven, the final goal for all of this is our salvation. Twelve, of course, hints at what the Old Testament prophets longed to see, which they didn't have the privilege of seeing, what we now know. So I want to begin initially by reading quickly from 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter announces himself. He said, I am an apostle, a special messenger of Jesus Christ. And he was writing to the elect dispersed all around Asia Minor. These potentially were persecuted Christians. So he was writing to them to give them encouragement and to give them hope, which applies to each and every one of us in this room this morning. So essentially, I want to, I've broken my talk into three different sessions. The first session is three to five, which thanks the Lord for his work of salvation. 
Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when Peter considered the salvation of God, his immediate response was to give praise. This is especially important because the motive of God's work is found in him, not in us. Because it's according to God's abundant mercy that he saved us. No other attribute could have helped us had mercy been refused. As we are by nature, justice condemns us. Holiness frowns upon us. Power crushes us. Truth confirms the threatening of the law, and wrath fulfills it. It is from the mercy of our God that all our hopes begins. One of the things I find very exciting about God, because in all truth, I didn't come to God happy and willing. That's the reality. I came to God I was born in a Christian home, as you do, raised as a Catholic in those days, moved away from that from the age of about 18, 19, and left, never turned to God until about 27, when I went back to church again. And even then, I was playing church. I didn't know God's name. I couldn't define who his personality is, nor his character. I couldn't tell you anything about God, but I went to church. But as life began to deal several blows, as I began to fail repeatedly, one business failure to another business failure to another business failure, bankrupt at the age of 27, my first business, and something inside of me kept letting me know there was more and that God's hand was in all of these things. So I remember one terrible failure in 1999, and I began to really argue and scream out to God. So I went through that cycle. Leave me alone. What have I done to you? I have worked hard. I'm honest. I'm talking to myself, but I was screaming out in pain, crying my head, frustrated, roll on the floor, you name it. You can just imagine God looking at me pitifully, I'm waiting for me to go through my pity party and come to my senses, which normally happens. So after I came to my senses, I said, all right, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. And I apologized over and over again. Anyhow, that has been the pattern of my life. So when you find me seeking, searching, reading three hours a day, two hours a day, sometimes seven hours a day, it's not because I'm a preacher or I want to be a preacher. No. Is because of my life. My life's at stake here. So I've had to do that because God made it known to me. Son, about 18 years ago, you will not make it without me. When I heard that, I had to go find out who this man is who says I will make it without him. So I came to him for selfish reasons, because I was broken, and because I was frustrated, and because I had enough. I had studied at the feet of champions, some of the best minds in the world, some of the biggest philosophers, leadership experts. I've sat, I have learned, I've spent fortunes traveling different parts of the world, learning. So mentally, I was sharp. But God was not impressed with all of that stuff. All right? So I got to the point where I'm like, all this is great stuff. Tony Robbins, all these guys are amazing. Thank you. My focus, and you look at my library today, 60% spiritual stuff. Because it's been made clear to me that that is my sustenance. And my mission, what God has sent me to the earth to do, is to give glory to his name in the business world. So I had to know what it's all about. So I say that to say this, that I have not come willingly. I've had to come and fight. Now, here's one of the things I discovered that gave me peace with God. He said, son, come boldly to the throne 
of grace. And the first thing he says that you will find when you come boldly, he said you will find mercy. I love that. He didn't say you'll be accused, you'll be whacked on the head with a big stick. I'll remind you of the sin you committed last week or last night or two or whatever it is. He said the first thing you will find when you come to me is mercy. This is important. Come to me. He said, but when you come, don't have your head down there dragging your feet like a defeated individual. Come to me boldly, with authority. You're coming to your father. He said, the first thing you receive from me is mercy and grace to help you in your time of need. Another word for grace is power. You receive power to help you in your time of need. People, there is no religion, even though we are not really a religion, us is a faith, it's a relationship with the creator, as powerful as the Christian faith. Honestly, nothing compares, nothing comes close. And a God who is present inside you and I right now, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, his spirit indwells you this moment. He didn't send us to the world to struggle and go it alone. That was not his idea. His idea was that we will call on him for assistance and for help. And this is why he sent you and I his spirit. His spirit is the spirit of counsel. So he's the counselor himself, which means he brings all the wisdom. He's the advocate. He's the strengthener who strengthens us. He's our standby right by our side. He's our helper in our time of need. His spirit is there. But we need to speak it out. We need to ask and we need to call. So Peter's writing to all of these people, trying to encourage them. As sinners, we had no hope beyond the grave. We had nothing to look forward to besides the certainty of judgment and fiery indignation as members of the first creation. Because the first creation, Adam fell. And everyone since been born into sin. And our future was essentially destruction. Until the second Adam showed up, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We were under the sentence of death until Jesus the Christ showed up and prayed for our sins. So now we are born again to a living hope because we have eternal life in a Savior who has conquered death himself. This living hope is not just an ordinary hope. The reason it's called a living hope is because we are hoping in Jesus, who has conquered death, and who is alive now. So our hope is alive. Our hope is in a person. So the hope lives because it is set upon an inheritance which is incorruptible that can never fade away because it is reserved in heaven. This is a significant contrast to any inheritance we can hope for here on earth. Our inheritance is in heaven. And I need to explain this a bit more because this is so true. You see, earthly inheritances, on the other hand, are uncertain at best. Sometimes people are deprived of their inheritance because of legal technicalities, which we've probably seen on TV or read in newspapers, people who successfully contest the will, and they succeed. Sometimes the value of an estate may drop sharply due to market conditions. Sometimes wills, as I mentioned, are successfully contested by people who were not mentioned in the will. But the divine inheritance we are talking about here are not subject to any of the changes of time. It is kept in the safety of heaven's vault. 
for every child of God. Your inheritance is kept in the safety of heaven's vault for you. It is important to know that we cannot experience the inheritance unless we are born again. Okay? Now, this is very, very important. Whilst I was away uh, last week, one of the top ladies in the company I went to speak for um, heard me speak, because these days when I speak, I'm bringing scriptures. Even though I'm teaching leadership or high performance, I bring in scriptures, because that's my reality. That's my life. Unfortunately, they haven't thrown me out yet. You know, because I am on a mission that they must hear the name of God. Everybody else is trying to make their names known. And if you look around the world, people are searching for this God who we have. They're going to India, searching of our gurus. They're going without shirts, walking bare feet, trying different things, climbing mountains in Tibet. They're looking for God. That's the truth. We have the real stuff. But we don't want to talk about it. God has challenged me to the point, if you follow my videos on Facebook, which Lady Anne does a lot, you will see I'm talking about it freely. You go on LinkedIn, which is meant to be a business platform. I am talking Jesus on business, on LinkedIn platform. I don't, because the people on LinkedIn, they have children. They're married. They get sick. They, get, they have problems. They get, they get divorced. They have everyday problems. So they need to hear Jesus. So everything I do now, whether you like it or not, Jesus has to come out of it. Okay? So, this lady came and she just held my hands. Sat on a table. I was trying to have dinner in peace and quiet. After speaking, you would be drained and tired. But they won't leave you alone. Did you? Oh, I know you're having your dinner, but they still sit around you. And she held my hands with both hands. I said to her, so you, know, you know, you are constantly telling me one child is in hospital, you're always in hospital, you're always in hospital. You've got three kids, the 18-year-old don't want to know. Your husband, she's looking at me. I said, the Lord wants you to take authority over your home. I said, he wants to work through you. Italian-American, she's, she's looking at me. See, I say a prayer every day. I said, this is beyond saying a prayer every day. You have to have understanding. She's looking at me. So I told her what to do. Here's what you need to do practically to arrest this situation because the enemy is loose in your house. Then I asked her a very simple question. I said, do you know Jesus? So you know, I mean, you know, we go to, we say the mass, we go, it's not about saying the mass. Do you know Jesus? She was hesitant. Um, yeah, well, that's right. Do you want to meet Jesus? I said to her, I, I kept my, I left my food on the table. I turned around. Do you want to meet Jesus? You could see the doubt in her eyes. I said, the first thing going on in your mind now, the enemy doesn't want you to say yes. She looked at me. I said, yes. She doesn't, he doesn't want you to say yes. I said, if you want to solve the things you're telling me, you are, you, the problems you have, you can't do without Jesus Christ. Mass not going to do it. You need the Holy Spirit inside you. I said, if you're ready, I'll lead you to Jesus right now. She looked at me. Say, I'm ready. She got born again that moment. I told people, I said, she's born again. She's going to have, you guys need to congratulate her. She's been writing, you said, Charles, I don't know what, what happened. That, that's our job. If you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've not accepted him and bowed your knees to him, you are playing church. I, I, just in case anyone is in here who has not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are playing church. You cannot see the power of God. Because the power of God is in the Holy Spirit. Who is, he has sent to live inside of you. And the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit only comes when you accept Jesus as Lord. Just for anyone who that is for, just receive that. Okay? So it is important to know that we cannot experience inheritance unless we are born again. Unregenerate man does not have the capacity to enjoy this inheritance. It would be like rewarding a blind person by showing them the most beautiful sunset or taking them to an art museum. They can't appreciate it. They can't see it. 
So verse 5, who are the people who are kept? By the power of God through faith. You see, the promise of our inheritance is certain. Because we are kept by the power of God, this enables us to endure through faith until the coming of Jesus Christ. You see, God's power garrisons us and our security. Garrisons. So it's like we are locked in because he protects us. This is according to Paul Hybert, the late American missiologist. We are kept by the power of God. But it's through our faith. It's not a one-sided traffic. We cannot be kept by the power of God until we begin to exercise our faith. All right? Now, the person who is kept is a person abiding in a continuing relationship of faith with God. So we could say the faith activates the preserving power of God in the life of the Christian. So while we are kept by the power of God, which is the divine side, which is the responsibility of God, however, it is our faith, which is our own human side and human responsibility. That's our part. So God has his part, which is to be kept by his power, we have our part in order to enjoy that protection, we have to exercise faith. So, while we are kept by the power, it's important our faith must be constantly exercised in this relationship with God. And I'll, I'll share a bit on that in a moment. So now from verse 6 to 9, this deals with the purpose of the trials that we all go through. So Paul, sorry, Peter was writing to these people, as I mentioned, trying to encourage them. So he said, even though we are grieving as we go through these great distresses, trials, crises, adversities, tribulations, severe temptations, we also rejoice in God's keeping power in the midst of all of these fires. So as Peter was writing to the Christians who are undergoing severe persecution because of their testimony of Jesus, once you testify about Jesus Christ being Lord, you will be tested. People are shocked and surprised that they are tested. I'll come to that in a moment. This is one of the most interesting paradoxes of our faith. Which is the point and the fact that we are able to experience joy in the middle of our fires. Where God supernaturally brings us peace in the midst of the heat. Makes no sense. We can't figure it out. How can this happen? How am I able to sleep when all these raging fires are around me? And I can lay on my bed and I sleep. And my heart, heart is calm. How is that possible with all of these fires? Because the Lord is keeping you. That's why he wants you to know he's there. Just like those guys, Shandrach, Misha, and Abednego, in the midst of the fire, he was in there with them. Just like all of his people, he was there with them. Let's, let me say one more thing, because I've asked God about this over and over again. Why do these things happen to Christians? We are Christians. We are the people of God. We have power. Why do we have to go through these things? God does not guarantee, ladies and gentlemen, that you will not go through fires and trials. Never in Scripture will you see God guarantee that. Never. I've searched. He does not guarantee you will not go through 
fires. But here's what he guarantees. If you will listen to him, to the instructions he's giving you, if you will listen to those instructions, he guarantees you at the end of that trial of fire, you will give praise. You didn't hear me. He guarantees at the end of it, you will give praise. Because it will take you way beyond what you thought. I say to people all the time, the trials, the crisis, every time you have obstacles, difficulties, gentlemen and ladies, those situations are usually pregnant with a divine visitation. Those situations are usually pregnant with divine visitation, which means search for God in there somewhere. God doesn't stroll just on the pavement of gold, smiling, you see him coming, everything's rosy. Usually, in the midst of your fires, if you look out, Father, where are you in here? You are here somewhere. You will end up giving praise. In my life, I can tell you that for sure. You will end up Giving praise. So, Peter is writing here. He says, so if need be, you have been grieved. Sometimes it is thought that a strong Christian will never be grieved in a trial. The idea is that a Christian should be like Superman. Though bullets are shot at Superman... They all bounce off his chest. Yet Peter here tells us that there is a need be, not only for the various trials, but more especially that there is a need be for being grieved. God has a purpose, not only for the trial, but also for the heavy grief we feel in the trial. He has a purpose. So he said our faith will be tested by fire. When the Lord took the children of Israel out of Egypt, I was taking them to the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, we begin to understand some key things that were going on. He declared to them, said, I have taken you through these trials. I have taken you through the wilderness. I have taken you through terrible times for this reason. He said, because I want to know what is in your heart. Whether you'll obey me and whether you'll keep my commandments. You see, we all think we are amazing and great for God. God allows us. He doesn't need to know because he knows all things. He wants you and I to know the condition of our own heart. When we go through this process, it's not God that is amazed or that is surprised. It is us. We are amazed at our own hearts. He allows us to see it. The time to give glory to God is not when you're driving your beautiful cars, living in your beautiful homes, going on exotic holidays. Everyone can give praise. The time to give praise God wants to know is when things don't work. When you are in the throes of despondency, in the you know, repeated paroxysms of pain and despondency, finding yourself in the quicksand, you are sinking in the mire. Will you give praise then? Will you curse God and die, as Job's wife asked him to do? 
Do you see, God, everyone who calls himself or herself a child of God, God will allow you to go through that process because he wants you to know what is truly in your heart. So when things don't work out, what do you do? The Apostle Paul gave us a great advice. He says, in all things, give praise. Not for all things, but in all things. Here's what I've found. Whatever situations you're going through right now, there is no situation right now that worship and praise won't take care of you out of. I didn't say prayer. Worship and praise. Try worship and praise. Try worship and praise. As you receive the bad news, get on your knees or bow. Just start giving praise. Before you deal with any other problem, just get on your knees and first give praise. Bring the Lord into the situation. Give praise. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. You are in here somewhere. You can never leave or forsake me. You will not. You will not. You will not. Lord, this is what's happened. I have no idea what to do, but I know you are here. I bring you into this situation. The first thing we do as Christians, we get on our knees, invite the Lord into that situation immediately. And then we'll begin to see clearer and better. So your faith will be tested by fire. Because we often are ignorant of how much or what kind of faith we have. God's purpose in testing is to display the enduring quality of our faith. So what I love about this is that there is comfort for all of us who are suffering saints. In knowing that there is a purpose and fruitfulness to all our suffering, there's a purpose for it. It's not empty. It's not baseless. One of the key purposes of afflictions is to test the genuineness of that faith you are professing you have. Here, Peter contrasts our faith with gold. Now, of all the substances known to man, gold is one of the most precious and one of the most imperishable. It can be subjected to intense heat and might seem to be indestructible, but the truth is that even gold perishes through use, through pressure, and true fire. True faith, on the other hand, is indestructible. The trials or fires we go through, instead of destroying our faith, they actually become food for our faith. Indeed, it is the honor of faith to be tried. Think about it. Shall any man profess to have faith? And never really have that faith tested? You can't keep going around and saying you're a woman of faith or a man of faith, and, but you've never been tested. How do you know? How do you know you're a woman of faith? How do you know you're a man of faith? If that faith you profess has never been put to the test. You need to have your faith tested. That's when you can declare that I am a man of faith, a woman of faith. Because that faith would have been tested. Think about it. Can you truly say, I have great faith in God, but I have never had to use it at any time? Where could I probably have, could I have discovered for myself Truly, whether I have it or not, if it has never been put to the test. But Peter is writing and he's saying that your faith is much more precious than gold. Gold that perishes. If gold is fit to be tested and purified by fire, then how much more our faith, which is far more precious than gold. So God has a great and important purpose in the testing of our faith. Faith is tested to show that it is sincere faith and it's true faith. Faith is tested to show the strength of the faith. Faith is tested to purify, to burn away the dross from the gold. Gold is one of the most durable of all materials, yet it too will one day perish. But our faith will not. 
Genuine faith will always result in praise, honor, and glory when Jesus Christ is revealed. This simply means that God will reward every instance of our faith. He'll reward it. And that is a fact. That's truth beyond fact. It's truth. Because your faith that stands the test of time, God rewards. God will praise those who remain joyful, those surrounded by trouble. He will award honor and glory to them who have been tried and tested, who endured their tribulation as a vote of confidence to God. So as I begin to round up, verse 10 says, God's Old Testament prophets, whom we've had the privilege of reading about in the first half of our book, of, of this wonderful book, the Bible, they were his ancient spokespeople. They spoke on his behalf. That's what they call prophets, one who speaks for God. These spokespeople searched and earnestly sought and they inquired from God. They kept prophesying the undeserved favor, which we will all receive. But even they did not fully understand what they were writing. Because they saw in bits. They were not giving the full picture. These Old Testament prophets did not understand, A, the identity of the person who would appear as the Messiah. They didn't know. B, the time of this appearance, they didn't know. But they were inspired by the Spirit of God to foretell the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that will follow. So if you are familiar with the works of Isaiah, Daniel, uh, King David, all of these people spoke and prophesied about the coming Messiah. But they saw in bits, they didn't have the full picture. Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah uh, chapter 53, the one that talks about Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ being bruised for iniquities, that uh, fantastic chapter. They were all talking about the Messiah. They didn't know his name. So one may only imagine how excited somebody like Isaiah would have been to be able to read the gospel of John that declares emphatically from the very first page in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word is God. And he was in the beginning. All things were made through him. Without him was nothing made. Isaiah would have been amazed to see the true identity of who they were prophesying. Here in Jesus Christ declare that he is the Word. Or in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, I think verse 18, where the Jesus Christ opened the manuscript and declared to them, the sovereign God has sent me. He has sent me to come and heal all the brokenhearted. To come and set free those who are held captive. To come and give sight to the blind. All those who are bound. All those who are unfairly treated. All those who are oppressed. He has sent me to come release them. And to come declare the favor of the Lord has come to all. He has sent me. The government of the world will be on his shoulder, Isaiah told us. Christ now has been revealed. We know much better than they all did because we are reading the, we're reading the finished book. They didn't see it. They didn't have it, but we have it. So Isaiah would have been very, very excited to be able to read what we are reading right now. So these prophets, the Spirit of God mysteriously revealed that these writings were not meant for them. So what are we writing about was not meant for them, but for a future generations. Even though they could partake of part of the meaning then, but they were being written for those who were not yet born for us. Part of God's eternal purpose is to show his wisdom to the angelic beings. The Bible says even the angels. Verse 12. It was then disclosed to them that the service they were rendering were not meant for themselves, and their period of time. But for you and I. It is these very things which have now already been made known plainly to you and I. By those who preach the good news. The gospel. Now 
This is quite interesting. Into these things, the very angels long to look. Even the angels were not aware of the plan that God has for the church age. Part of God's work I mean, from my notes here, this is quite interesting. It says, part of God's eternal purpose is to show his wisdom to the angelic beings through his work with the church, which you'll find in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 onwards. God wants the angels to look in on what he does in the church. And the idea is that the angels are bending over with keen and intense interest and desire to learn what is happening with us. The immense privilege of believers in this age is seen not only in that we understand clearly what was veiled from the prophets, but also in the fact that angels desire to look into these very truths which we are living right now. That the church is an object lesson to angels, setting forth the manifold wisdom of God. But it is not for them to know the joy that our salvation brings. So church, the central thesis of this message this morning is to number one, understand the plan for salvation. Number two, understand the path we have to play in this entire process. Number three, know God's love and that it is his power that keeps us. But for that part to keep, us, to keep us, we have to constantly exercise and demonstrate our faith in a dynamic relationship with the Father, trusting him and letting him know, we trust you, Lord. We hope in you. We believe in you. We know this will all end in praise. We know you will not leave us. You will not forsake us. We know you can do exceeding abundantly above what I did think, ask, or desire. You can do a thousand times more. Father, we know that there is nothing that happens to us that does not happen to other people. We know. We begin to declare our faith being tested is a painful exercise. Going through trials, it's a painful exercise. But we have the assurance from God himself. There is a reason for that, and it will end in praise. Whatever you're going through this morning, whatever you go through this week, whatever you go through this month, this year, let me say this to you from the word of God and from practical experience. Whatever you are going through, you will come out giving praise. You will come out giving praise, long as two things happen. Number one, try not to respond to offense. Try not to pay back whatever anyone's done to you. Try not to revenge. I use the word try because I know how tempting it is to try and revenge. <laughs> but the minute you do that, you've removed the power of God from the situation because he himself has declared that vengeance is mine. If you are helping him revenge, you don't need him. And here's a thought I want to leave in your mind. I put out a video not that long ago, all right, about the power of your enemies. Listen. God has, the Bible says in heaven, the government of God is in heaven, his kingdom. The host of heaven, these are tens, multiplied tens of millions of angel armies in his kingdom, in his government. When God says he's going to fight for you, who are you? Look at the power behind God that he's using to fight on your behalf. Get out of the way. Hand it over to him. Father, I trust you. You will vindicate. Father, I trust you. you say, whatever situation you are going through, remember we don't serve a dead God. He's on the throne. He hears your prayer. He sees your tears. And the answer has already been sent to you. God bless you all. Thank you, Lydia.